This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 245. And Ben, this week, we have a pretty interesting lineup. I know this is typically what we call an us episode, where it's you and I, but we actually have three special guests this week. And it's interesting how these these episodes kind of come together during the weeks leading up to recording. And this week, things really fit together nicely. And I think you'll see at the end of this podcast how that all happened. So off the top, we are joined by our, our new friends from Morningstar in Chicago, Samantha Lamas and Danielle Labotka. Interesting follow-up to your great work on goals, goal setting. Yep. And then we're also going to be joined by another Canadian financial advisor, Mark McGrath, who put out a tweet this week that was simply unreal for a bunch of different reasons. So we invited Mark to join us. I'm also going to do a quick review of the book, The Status Game, which was wonderful. I'm also going to do a quick 60-second review of our conversation in episode 85 with Dennis Molsey-Williams, which, Ben, can you believe it? We recorded it almost three years ago to the day. It's crazy. We, we, were, we were talking to a past guest not long ago, and they mentioned, oh, yeah, when I was on the podcast two years ago. I was like, was it two years ago? <laughs> no one checked. It was two years, <laughs> two years ago. ago. Crazy. And then, yeah. of course, you have our after show, which is kind of a mishmash of all kinds of different things. Yep. I think it's going to be a great episode. Uh, if, if you're in Canada and want to learn more about PWL Capital, you can book a, a no-commitment intro call with uh, with one of our advisors through our website, pwlcapital.com. Uh, we would love to hear from you. You can also email uh, info at rationalreminder.ca if you want to chat to us about the podcast. Exactly. All right. Good to roll. Let's go to the episode. It's a good one. Welcome to episode 245 of the Rational Reminder podcast. All right. So let's dive into our conversation about the goals, the great goals work. I am such a fan of that paper, as you know. And let, let, describe to the audience kind of the process of how we ended up speaking to our, to our friends at Morningstar. Okay, so Morningstar did a paper uh, co-authored by uh, Samantha, one of, the, one of the guests that we have coming up in a second here. Uh, it's a 2019 paper called Mining for Goals. And they basically went through the idea that we've talked about now many times in the podcast, including discussing that paper numerous times, um, the, the, the general idea that people, people are not good at identifying what their goals are. Um, so we, we took that and we, we found that valuable as an insight and interesting as a concept. So we ended up doing, as listeners know, because many of them participated, we ended up doing this goals survey uh, last year where we asked people three questions. And the questions were, uh, uh, drawn from other other research about how to how to overcome these issues with uh, not being able to identify all of your goals. So the process was, you answer the question, what are your financial goals, and then you have to try and double the list. And then we gave what are ca- categorical prompts. Uh, we basically just uh, gave people categories using the the PERMA model is what we had for categories, and said financial goals might fall into one of these categories. Does that elicit any more? any more goals. Right. So people went through, 310 people went through that process of the three questions and we collected this huge bank of written response goals. So there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of, of data. And we were very conscious, I was very conscious of the fact when we did that, that uh, research that we didn't have expertise in, in conducting surveys or in analyzing qualitative data, but we knew that we had a pretty cool data set. Because you read through the responses and it's like, wow, there's a lot of there's a lot of thought that went into this from a right. lot of different people. Like you could tell that a lot of time was spent creating the data set, um, but we were nervous about missing insights because we didn't have, we never <laughs> looked at this type of data before. Yeah. Uh, so we sent it around to a few people that do have the expertise to to analyze that type of data, um, and one of the places that we sent it to was Morningstar's behavioral insights team. And they were kind enough to uh, answer my email. I wasn't sure if, you know, if they would answer. And they did. And they were more than happy to, to look at the data, which they did. 
Uh, and they've actually got some incredible work and, and insights at a level that we just weren't able to, to tease out from, uh, from the data. Exactly. So joining us is Samantha Lamas, who is a senior behavioral researcher at Morningstar and is a recipient of the Montgomery Warshower Award for her research in financial planning. Her research focuses on investor engagement and the factors that drive people's decision-making about investing and money. So perfect. Her work delves into how people think about their financial goals, what they look for when seeking financial advice, and what kinds of mental shortcuts people use when making decisions about their personal finances. Yep, and and we're also joined by Danielle Labotka, who's a behavioral scientist at Morningstar. Her research looks at how investors' financial decisions are influenced by numerous cognitive and linguistic factors by investigating investors' behaviors, preferences, and attitudes, both in everyday and financial planning scenarios. And Danielle's got her PhD in psychology from the University of Michigan, and her work's been published in in uh, top psychology journals. They've been great. I mean, we've had a few phone calls with them. They're a great team. Really nice people to work with on this. I I mean, listen, like I said, I, I sent this email not knowing if, because Morningstar is a big company. <laughs> not, you know, I didn't... <laughs> I don't know if they would they would answer. And not yeah. only did they answer, but they they were willing to take our data and and do some some pretty serious analysis on it. So very very grateful for the whole process. And I agree completely that they've been a pleasure to to work with on this project. All right, so let's go to our conversation with Samantha Lamas and Danielle Lavatka. Samantha and Danielle, welcome to the Rational Reminder Podcast. Hello, thanks for having yes. us. Thank you for having us. Can you guys tell us what are some of the obstacles in identifying the 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 right goals? Yeah, well, the issue is there's there's many, and that's really because there are so. The question itself is very complex. So if you ask someone, you know, what are your overarching thirty year financial goals? So much goes into that question. There's there's math and numbers, things that people aren't comfortable with. There's emotions because it ha- deals with all the money that people have saved up over years and worked for and then it kind of forces us to forecast which you know human beings aren't really good at doing so what happens is that when people are asked this question all of these issues sort of um, combine and encourage us to go to our cognitive biases. so things like hyperbolic discounting you know where our minds aren't wired to think about incentives in 30 years. We're thinking, we're thinking about the here and the now. Um, At the same time, you know, who knows who will be in 30 years in some ways that person's a complete stranger. So how are we supposed to know what they're going to want? Um, Or for example, availability bias, you know, uh, our tendency to go with information that comes most quickly to mind. Uh, So if we went to a great housewarming party, maybe when we're asked this question, buying a house pops into our head, even though we've never really thought about it seriously. Hmm. Um, so what ends up happening is people go with these these top of mind goals and they sort of blurt them out and they sound good, but they may have forgotten goals that are important to them or they may have not even thought about goals that are important to them. Um, but they're sticking with these surface level goals and not really digging deeper for these, for these deeper goals. Um, so what we like to sort of boil this down to is three key overarching barriers that people face when goal setting. Um, and those are that people struggle to identify our goals right now. Um, we, we also struggle to get into this think abstractly mode. So we're, we're so present minded that we're stuck in the concrete. You know, we're thinking about buying a house or buying a car or paying for your child's education in three years and not these bigger overarching goals. Um, and then at the same time, we struggle to know what we're going to want in 30 years. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Those are the key ones, yeah. So let's dig into that a bit. What challenges does this pose, you know, for people like Ben and I as financial advisors or for financial decision makers more generally? Yeah, this I, I think this puts you guys in a pretty tough position because essentially what you have to do is you have to help clients get to an end point that they can't even imagine yet. It's sort of taking them through a self-discovery process of understanding their own goals. And, you know, for the individual, it's about forcing yourself to think deeper, to go past these high level, top of mind, surface level goals 
um, which can be an uncom uncomfortable process because you kind of have to acknowledge that maybe you don't know. <laughs> you have to think more about it. Okay, so we, we we did this big project, uh, as of course you know, where we collected survey data from a bunch of our podcast listeners and and some of our clients, uh, and it was all it was words. It was a bunch of a bunch of text, uh, which is data that we we had never really played with before. Which is one of the reasons that we sent it to you. Can you talk about what methods you use to analyze all of that textual data? Yeah. So I mean, working with text data really is just kind of <laughs> a tall order to, to do. Um, there's a lot of it and it can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. So we chose to analyze your survey data using natural language processing techniques. And basically natural language processing is a form of artificial intelligence in which we have computers parse through large amounts of human language, like all of the responses from the survey to extract different features from the text. So one natural language processing technique we used is called topic modeling. And topic modeling is where we get the computer to go through all the different responses that we have and start extracting common topics people mention by pulling out words that tend to occur together. And now there are actually multiple techniques for topic modeling. And since computers can't actually understand human language like we do, we used two different methods and compared their results. So from there, we use the topics that we saw in both methods to create a new master list of goals based on what people mentioned when they answered the survey. Hmm. Okay, and, and as kind of like a, like a gut check, we manually coded all of that data, which was probably way less efficient than what you did. How did the uh, analysis that you did match up with our manual coding? Yeah, you know, we actually do a fair amount of our own manual coding <laughs> as well. So uh, we we give you props for, for putting in the time and effort because it is very intensive. Um, and happily, our results match very well with your manual coding. Um, so some of our topics directly mapped onto the coding categories you had, like being able to pay for your children's education and being able to comfortably afford luxuries. However, our method actually yielded fewer items on the ending master list because some of the topics that we got from the natural language processing technique combined a few of the goals that you had in your manual coding. So for example, in your coding, you had two different goals for financially supporting my community or causes that are important to me and giving time to community and causes that are important to me. Um, whereas our results combined the two of those for one goal that we called donating time and money to charity. Mm -hmm. How did the goals identified change as the uh, respondents progressed through the questions? Yeah, this was a this was a fun discovery. So as as Danielle mentioned, we we split up the goals into different topics, um, and then one of the things we did is we split up the results by by each question that you guys presented, um, and then compared them. So really, in step one. We got a lot of the the typical financial goals that you would typically hear in a financial advisor's office. So things like uh, retirement, owning a home. So obviously very important goals, but they don't really give an advisor a sense of you know a deeper insight into what motivates a person. Um, and step two, we got topics that were largely the same as step one, so nothing too exciting there. But step three, we started to see these a huge difference, right? We started to see these deeper goals come into play. And it was obviously an influence of the perma V manipulation. So we got goals that here, I have a the slide open on my screen, um, related to, you know, living a healthy lifestyle, donating more, um, uh, spending more time with loved ones, having time for, for hobbies, etc, and relationships. So these these goals that give you maybe a better understanding of what a person's true life values are, you know, the things that are at the core of their well-being and what really makes them happy, um, and maybe even gives the advisor some insight into what financial goals they could be right. aiming for. Yeah. Hmm. What, what was the main insight that you drew from the way that the, that the goal identification changed as the survey progressed? Yeah, we think the big takeaway in terms of that is that, you know, not all prompts are created equal in terms of how they elicit goals from people. 
So, you know, as Sam mentioned in that first prompt where we're asking, what are your goals? Uh, in some ways, that's like an icebreaker uh, to ask clients because it's good for eliciting those surface goals from clients. You know, the really common ones that they're probably in there for the for, uh, coming to talk to you for the first place. So, the, you know, talking about retirement, buying a home, things like that. So it's really good to kind of get people warmed up in some ways for for what is perhaps to come a more deeper conversation. Um, but when we looked at the asking people to just, you know, tell you more, say, say more, um, we didn't find that that actually yielded more useful responses. In fact, when we looked at that, and when we looked at the responses, they were less positive following this prompt compared to the other two. Um, and we think that that is potentially counterproductive to a fledgling advisor client relationship. Mm. When you might be asking these questions in the first place. And so finally, we see that, you know, providing that structure and reminding people of what their values are with something like the Permanent framework can maybe give clients boost they need to start digging in for those deeper goals that previously remained hidden. So, you know, while it's good and maybe even necessary to prompt clients to dig into their deeper goals, we want you to, you know, make sure you're doing so in a way that encourages clients to to think along these lines and not kind of go backwards and talk about more um, artificial things again. Yeah, that's super interesting. So d doubling the list, the, the the prompt to double the list was less helpful than the categories. And then of course, the, the untested prompt that we didn't test in our survey was to present them with this master list that we've now created and see what, what that elicits. How does identifying deeper goals help with the long horizon decision making? Yeah, there's there's a few things we can point to here based on our thinking on it. So one, these these deeper goals can maybe promote more flexibility or wiggle room in a person's financial plan. Um, so for example, let's say there's a client that comes into your office and they they want a beach house in Key West um, when they retire, um, but after some digging, maybe using some of these exercises, either the master list or the Prima V, et cetera, you know, you uncover that what the person really cares about is spending quality time with their family. And the reason why they wanted the beach house in Key West was because they had a lot of great family vacations there and that's what they're keeping in their head. But the truth is that the likelihood of that specific goal of a beach house in Key West changing is probably pretty high, right? Because because life, life happens, things, things get complicated, you know, the kids move far away, um, the budget doesn't play out as nicely, there's grandchildren to consider now, no one can get time off, etc, whatever. Um, but that deeper goal of spending quality time with your family, that one's probably not going to change. Um, so if, if the plan is focused on that deeper goal, well, maybe instead of a beach house in Key West, that can turn into you know, a house in the suburbs close to the grandchildren. Hmm. Um, another sort of idea that we, we were ruminating on was this idea that having a clear why or a goal focus on the why can be a great motivator. So we know from existing research that um, having the right goals can motivate people to stick to their financial plan. But when it comes to this, putting it in terms of these deeper goals, you can see how that can be even more motiv motivating. For example, telling a client, hey, if you stick to your savings and spending plan, um, you'll put a few more thousand dollars into your bank account to buy that beach house versus telling them that if you put more effort into your savings and spending plan now, you'll have a few more years to spend those family vacations with your kids before they go off to college. So that, that, that connection to their deeper why can be more motivating than just saving more money. Um, and the last idea that we kind of had came, came from something that Kitcha says a lot, which is that people not only struggle to identify their long-term goals, but they also struggle to understand what's possible with their assets. So mm. once an advisor knows a person's deeper goals, they can start to help open the client's minds to other possibilities. So going back to the beach house example, let's say the beach house doesn't work out or you discover that the person's true deeper goal is to spend quality time with their family. So maybe 
they need a place close to the family. They still want a place by, you know, a body of water. So maybe that turns into a lake house by a smaller body of water and a small condo in the suburbs. You know, Hmm. I'm sure the client never thought of that opportunity or that possibility because they were so focused on the surface goal of beach house in Key West. Hmm. Yeah, it's super interesting. You get more abstract and then there are more options to achieve the abstract goal as opposed to a singular concrete goal. Exactly. Yeah. What would you say is the main takeaway from your analysis uh, of, of our data on how people should go about identifying their goals? Yeah, I think that what we get here is that it's important for people to slow down and take the time to identify their goals using different approaches. And we think that there are kind of two benefits to doing this. The first benefit is something that Sam's talked about very nicely, which is that it gives people the opportunity to start unpacking their deeper goals, which can really give them and their advisor insight into why their surface goals matter. So really being able to understand what the driving force there is in terms of wanting that beach house. The other benefit is that taking that time to write and revise a list of goals gives people the opportunity to see that these goals don't have to be static. Um, They can be flexible. And in the long run, this is going to help them you know, be open to achieving things they hadn't imagined before. So sometimes uh, we can, as humans, just get very fixed in our ways of thinking when we feel that we've committed to something. And so getting that practice early on of learning, you know, my financial goals are really not a one and done situation. I'm allowed to revise them. I'm allowed to see them in new light. Um, is good practice for them when, you know, there might be more difficult decisions down the road where that flexibility can be important. Um, So we think it's really important to see this as not a one-off question and answer type of situation. Um, You want it to be seen as something that's more progressive and an ongoing conversation that you're having with yourself or with your financial advisor. So how can financial advisors use this information to improve their financial advice? Yeah, we think that something might that might be interesting for financial advisors to do based on this research is to incorporate multiple goal setting exercises into their meetings with clients. So um, something like starting out clients with a master list exercise can help them start to articulate not only like what is top of mind, but it can also get them exposed to the wide range of possibilities available to them that maybe they haven't even thought of. Um, And then it kind of also does that nice little piece of teaching them that it's okay to revise their goals. So we think that starting out with a master list approach can really be a good way to introduce goals, financial goals and revising those goals to clients. And A good follow-up might be to do one of those values-based goal-setting exercises, like prompting your clients with the PERMA-V framework. That way, you know, clients and advisors can start to identify what the values-based motivators for clients are. So we think that identifying these goals, can, these deeper goals, can be helpful in getting clients to stay committed to their financial plan, but also to be open to those different opportunities that may fulfill their deeper goals, but look very different than the way they originally imagined. Hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting to think about from a, from a process perspective. Um, so you, you guys, your, your team kind of kicked off this, this, or at least inspired us with the research that, that, that you did on this, I think in 2019. Uh, we've maybe pushed it forward a little bit. What do you think is the next step with this line of research? Yeah, uh, like any good research study, I think doing this one and then doing um working with your data just brings up more questions there <laughs> there's plenty of more work to do to figure out the mechanisms involved so like for example is there something special about the prima v framework probably not right is there something special about th- the specific master list we originally used or this new master list you know probably not right now our thinking is maybe it's more about the process itself so just using a master list or using a checklist something to help you know, nudge people to to think more carefully about their goals, um, that maybe that might be causing this impact of getting people to think more deeply, et cetera. Um, but that being said, what this means for us is, you know, it's time to start talking about this research more with 
financial advisors, especially, you know, people who are on the ground talking to individuals, maybe hopefully using some of these exercises, um, getting their thoughts on it, and then hopefully supplementing those insights with more original research. So what we try to do is make it an iterative process, right? Try out something, create a practical exercise, bring it to advisors, get their thoughts about it, and then start again, always be improving in some ways. Hmm. Awesome. Well, we, we look forward to seeing whatever comes next. Uh, Samantha and Danielle, we, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Um, and and for the, the original research that, that, like I mentioned before, kind of inspired us to look more into this. Uh, it's, it's, all of it's just great. And I think it is, uh, it is helping clients make better decisions. Great. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your data with us. It was, it was, it was a lot of words, as you mentioned, but a lot of fun to work with too. <laughs> Yeah, great, great insights. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. So this past week, our professional colleague, Mark McGrath, posted a thread on Twitter that went viral. And when it had a warning in the opening and saying that it was not a positive message, I was, and many others were, compelled to read it all. And it was an incredible story. So with that, Mark, welcome to the Rational Minder podcast. Thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Ben. It's nice to be here. Yeah, it was incredible, incredible tweet. So thanks so much for, for coming on. So what made you want to share this story about your dad? Yeah, you know, I think I've wanted to share it for a while. So it, it's been it's been 10 years this October that um, that this happened. And I don't know that I've had a good place to to kind of put it out in the past. Um, I never, I didn't have, you know, besides my close friends and close family who were there with me through that event and new friends that I've made, you know, it, it inevitably, inevitably come up in conversation from time to time, but I didn't really have an outlet to kind of sit down and, and think my way through the story in the way that I wanted to tell it. And Twitter has been this incredible outlet for me. Um, as you guys know, I do a lot of, I do a lot of writing on Twitter and I think I, I was sitting down the other night. I do a lot of writing in the evening after my son goes to bed and I was sitting there thinking, what am I going to write about this week? And it's just been on my list of ideas to write about for so long. And I think I just finally got to the point where I was comfortable enough with my own writing to be able to tell the story. But I also had, I think, enough of an audience in terms of kind of the number of followers, the number of people I was interacting with on a regular basis on Twitter, friends that I've made on Twitter that I thought would uh, appreciate the the story. And, and some of these friends on Twitter that I don't know very well. And I just know them from Twitter, like a lot of the FinTwit fin -twit community. Right. And mm. so it just, it just kind of all came together and I thought I'm going to sit down and write it. And, uh, I edited it a number of times because I scheduled it out a few days in advance and I kept going back to it and realizing there was more that I wanted to say, but at mm. the end of the day, it's Twitter. It's, it's a short form platform and you don't want to write a 5,000 word blog post. So it took me some time to get to the point where I was like, I, I think I've, I've said enough and enough of the things I want to say. Yep. And uh, I just kind of hit schedule and then I had a, a busy day yesterday with work. And when I had time to finally look back at the the response to it and the reactions to it, I was just floored, just blown away. So Mark, if, if you're comfortable doing so, can you, can you take us through the, the story? Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd be happy to. So the story is about my dad. Um, my dad grew up in a very small town in Quebec called Chandler, which is uh, which is in the Gaspé region, and obviously has a an Anglophone last name McGrath. It's a it's an Irish last name, and he he grew up in a predominantly Francophone community, in a small community, with his three older siblings, his two older brothers, and his older sister, and my my grandparents who ran a, a hotel called the Shamrock Hotel. It's a very sort of traditional Irish kind of uh, a, a drinking hole and and hotel. And the way my dad described it to me was that he got picked on so relentlessly for being Anglophone by just by name. I mean, they, they, they grew up French speaking and everything else and fit in by all other accounts, but um, mm -hmm. they, he just got picked on relentlessly. He was bullied. And so he ended up taking up martial arts and, and karate. But I think as a family, they decided to get out of that town. And so they all sort of moved out West to, um, to Vancouver, not, not simultaneously, but kind of, you know, my, my, my dad came, my grandparents came with him. So I grew up living with my, my grandparents and then his siblings moved out, out West as well. And from, from the early days, he worked in my uncle's tile store. So his older brother, uh, my uncle Morgan, who, who actually passed away last year, 
in his 80s. Um, he started a, a tile store called Tile Town. And my dad being the younger brother, he was working for his big brother, just sweeping floors and that kind of stuff, and decided he wanted to do something for himself. And the only thing he knew about was tile because he'd worked for his brother. So he opened a competing store called Richmond Tile Center. And he did that at a, a relatively young age. And uh, it went it went pretty well. He, he changed locations once or twice, but that was his store, right? That's what that's that's what he did. He was very money conscious. Uh, he used to tell me a story about when he and my mom got married. My dad bought their first car. It was a Mini Cooper, and it cost four thousand dollars. And when he bought it, my mom was shocked. She was like, "Where did you get this money? I didn't even know you had the money to buy this car." And it was all the money he had. And he told her, I didn't want you to marry me for my money. And so you can get kind of the, the idea of how important money was to him from the sense that $4,000 to him was, was the world. You know, it was a lot of money and he, he was very private about it. And he remained very private about his finances throughout his life. Um, but he ran the store. The store for him was a means to an end. Like, I don't think he was passionate about tile by any means. He could have grown it into a, a multi-location franchise or some sort of enterprise. And it just kept it as his store because it allowed him the freedom and flexibility to do the things that he liked to do, but also to earn enough of an income and save enough money to meet his end goal, which was retirement. Um, it was very clear to my brother and I and my mom that really what he was doing with this business was using it as a way to support his future retirement. And that's it. Right. He was incredibly active. <clears throat> he, uh, even into his fifties, he had a six pack, which I, I respect it now. I don't think I respected it back then, but being 39 and seeing how difficult that is to, to achieve, I think it was very impressive. He, uh, he used to swim at the pool. He would do 80 laps a week, uh, 80 laps per session rather. And he would do that three times a week, which was, which was incredible. So he was very, very disciplined. And a lot of that he attributed to his days in, in karate. He eventually got a black belt. He was very disciplined, uh, very shrewd with his money. And um, he was a, just pretty relentless as an entrepreneur. Like he would, um, he lost friendships over his business because a friend of his was a contractor, for example, and the contractor chose another tile provider for the building he was doing. And my dad just cut him off. That's it. Hmm. He was just disciplined like I've never seen. Um, but I mean, it was great. We had, we had a great upbringing, great childhood. We had money uh, and we weren't rich by by most definitions but we had everything we needed we played sports you know we had vacations parents never missed a game it was by all accounts a, a good upbringing and um you know fast forward he was 58 at the time and we all went out for dinner one night and just like some dive pub kind of place we're ordering wings he's like i got some news i sold the business i'm retiring and it just, we're like, wow, you know, like, this is what you always work for. This is it. You did it. Like, congratulations. And we were just, we were over the moon for him. And uh, he was happy. Uh, we didn't talk about the structure of the deal or like what the, you know, how much he sold it for or anything like that. That was, that didn't matter. He had made the decision that financially he could do this. We didn't question that at all. Wow. And he booked a, a ticket to, um, to Asia. He spent a lot of time traveling, loved Japan, loved Southeast Asia, uh, so he kind of booked a one-way ticket and said, I'm probably going to go for a couple months and just enjoy my time. I, I don't need a return ticket because I don't have the store to come back to kind of thing, right? So he did that and he was gone for about two and a half months before he came back. And within a couple of weeks of him coming back, he moved, um, sorry, he didn't move. He went back to work for the guys that he sold the company to. And it was a small shop, right? Like four employees. These employees were his friends. His best friend in the whole world was the first guy that he hired at the store when this guy was 17. His name was Terry. Great guy. They were still best friends. And he, I think he just missed it. He just missed this thing that he built, the atmosphere, the, the camaraderie, the friendship, just something to wake up and go do. So he was kind of working for lunch money for a bit there. But very quickly, we noticed this sort of cognitive, I don't want to say it was a cognitive decline in terms of his mental functioning capacity. He was, he was brilliant. He was very smart. He was still very sharp. But you could just see him kind of change. And he used to joke a lot. In the, and it just became more seldom that he would that he would joke and that he would have fun and that he would laugh. And, you know, he's a big golfer. He was a scratch golfer. He went golfing every day for the first little bit. And I think he just kind of ran out of things to do. Um, and, and I don't think he saw any of that coming because he had worked so hard for this moment and he had golfed so much and he had traveled so much. And I think retirement for him was just an opportunity to do more of that. And he thought the freedom to do that would be 
that's that's what retirement is supposed to be, right? That's what it's that's what it's all about. And uh, so, so very quickly, we noticed, you know, sort of a depression kind of creeping into him. And at one point, he checked himself into the UBC psychiatric ward. UBC is the, the big university hospital out here uh, in, in Vancouver. And I remember him calling me from the UBC psych ward saying, I was having some dark thoughts, and I decided to check myself in. And to me, that was, I was happy that he had done this, because it showed to me that he had the wherewithal of the understanding and the self-awareness yeah. to realize that something was going on. And I, I, I think that's impressive because I don't think a lot of people would have sought help that quickly. Mm. And, and this is before we had really noticed anything too serious going on with him. Um, so I went to visit his buddies now with like half the people on the ward. And I was kind of like, what are you doing here? And he's like, I don't know. I, I like, I shouldn't have done this. I'm, I don't, I don't belong here. Um, mm. So I'm going to get myself out. And so he did, and they, they prescribed him some, some medications and that type of thing. And he got out and we thought, okay, things can't be that bad. Like he, he went to the psych ward and they were kind of like, we don't know that you need to be here. So he checked out. And then very soon after that, uh, there was one night where my brother, my mom and I, and my dad were supposed to meet at my mom's house for dinner. And my parents were living apart at this time, Com completely separate story, totally unrelated to my dad's retirement. They'd been living apart for a long time, still had a great relationship. They were friends. They lived down the street from each other. Um, and my dad just didn't show up for dinner, which was very unlike him. He was very punctual. Punctual. We could always call him. We could always text him. Like There was never a reason for him not to pick up his phone, and we just couldn't get a hold of him. Hmm. And so we kind of just sat around twiddling our thumbs for a bit. And I distinctly remember my mom at some point going from calm and reserved to a full-blown panic attack. Like she kind of just, she she screamed and she said, something is wrong. So I don't know what hit her, but something hit her that there was something terribly wrong. It, it was about half an hour after he was supposed to have shown up. And so, yeah, we thought this was kind of strange. So we, we called the police <clears throat> and we didn't know if they would do anything. Because you see in the movies and stuff, right? They say like, well, if they're not missing for 24 or 48 hours, then we're not going to do right. anything. And so we thought that that might be what they said. We just didn't know what else to do, right? We called his friends. They didn't pick up the phone. So the police came over and they were talking to us in my mom's living room. And as we were chatting about why we had made the call, my brother noticed the, the constable kind of did one of these with his earpiece in. Right. And my brother noticed, he said, what's that? Like, you just got a call in your earpiece. And like, what was it? And so he came back and he said, your dad's alive, but he's been in a car accident. And I'm appreciative of the way that he said, First, your dad's alive because we were obviously thinking the worst. There had been some some concerns about this, um, and he was in the hospital. He's been in the car accident. He's fine. He's alive. He didn't he didn't say he's fine. He said he's alive and he's in the hospital. So we were relieved at first, and then as we were driving to the hospital, it occurred to me that we have absolutely no idea what type of condition he's in. All we know is he's alive. He could be he could be paralyzed. He could be unconscious. He could be in a coma. Um, we just don't know. <clears throat> and when we got to the hospital, there wasn't a scratch on him. Like he was completely fine and he he was emotionally broken he was crying and he was telling us about how important we were to him and how my mom was his his rock and his his everything and this was strange because they'd been living apart for for so long that their romantic relationship was 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 gone and had been gone for a long time and he was holding her hand and i remember my mom telling me after she's like that might he hasn't held my hand like that in years right so there was something going on inside him but he, he walked away from it without a scratch. And they had to use the jaws of life to actually pry him from the wreckage of the car. The accident was so bad. Incredible. And it was really strange because he had he was such a good driver. Like, I, I know a lot of guys think they're great drivers. Um, probably a lot of confirmation bias there. But uh, he was. He really was. Like, he just had an exceptional driving record. And the intersection where this accident happened, it's, it's a, it's a J-curve intersection. Right. And if you go straight through that J curve, it, it goes up a hill into a strip mall. And from what the the police officers told us, from what the cameras caught at the intersection, is he went around 100 kilometers an hour through that intersection. And this is the speed zone is 60. There's no reason for him to be driving 100 kilometers through this intersection. It's an intersection that he drives twice a day on his way to and from work. He didn't it, it wasn't a new intersection to him. He knew exactly where he was going. And, but he was wearing a seatbelt, which was really, really strange, right? Because now we're, we're just saying, did he do this intentionally? But if he did, why did he put his seatbelt on? Like, what was the purpose of, how did this all happen? And he, he wouldn't really explain himself. 
So I called his friend, Terry, his best friend, and said, like, what do you think's going on? He's like, I don't know, but your dad told me that he hid his wallet under a garbage can in a parkade on the other side of town before the accident happened. And he told me not to tell you guys. And I'm telling you now because I think it's important and I don't know why he did this or didn't want you to know about it, but I think you should know. And the only reason that I can think he would have done that is because he didn't want his identity to be revealed at the scene of the accident. And see, I, I don't have an answer to why. And, and maybe there isn't an answer. Maybe it was just confusion or something, but, but that's what he did. So things are getting stranger for us, obviously. And, uh, but he seemed to come out of it kind of okay. Like it seemed like there was some sort of revelation or epiphany after this, this accident. And he realized things were not that bad and he was very caring and, and very emotional, but very quickly, like within, within a very short period of time, he started to decline again. And he was terrified that the police were coming after him over the accident. Like he thought he was going to jail. And so he was arranging his affairs in such a way that he was going to jail. And we just could not describe to him that this was, this was silly. There was no crime. You know, he hadn't hurt anybody. Thankfully he hadn't even hurt himself at the end of the day. He hadn't committed a crime. I mean, a speeding ticket is really all he's guilty of, but he could not get it out of his head that he was going to, he was going to prison over this. And it consumed him. Like from that point on, he physically changed. He lost weight. He stopped eating steak and this guy, like he used to make hamburgers with raw ground beef and he would eat the raw ground beef while he was making hamburgers. That's how much he loved meat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Disgusting. I know, but he just, and we used to laugh at him for doing it, but he just loved meat so much. So for him to just not eat steak all of a sudden was a really big red flag for us. And he stopped drinking beers. He loved his beers, just Corona's light beers, but he just stopped drinking them altogether. And it wasn't because he had a problem with alcohol. It was because he said he didn't like beer anymore. So these he was having this physical manifestation of these, these changes in him. Wow. And um, at the time I was working at a bank and I was on the sky train home from work one day and he called me and he said, what are you up to? And I was like, I'm just on my way home from work. What are you up to dad? He said, well, I got in a fight with your mom. I'm going to go grab a hotel. I was like, Oh, okay. Um, just like come to my place. Like just come crash at my house. You don't need to go get a hotel. Like, don't be silly. You're like I'll be home in 15 minutes. Just drive over. It's, you know, half an hour away. He's like, no, 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 I don't want to put you out. I don't want to bother you. It's fine. I'm going to go grab a hotel. Call me tomorrow. And that was, that was the last time I talked to him. Um, and it's strange for me to reflect on that moment because it was such a casual conversation. And at that time, there was nothing that jumped out about his demeanor or his language that indicated to me that anything was more or less wrong than it had been over the previous you know, couple of months. So the rest of that evening for me was, was pretty normal. I went home. My wife and I had dinner, went to bed, and at 11, 11, 11.30, uh, I was sleeping. My phone rang. It was a private number. And as a rule, I don't answer private calls. So I ignored it, tried to go back to sleep, and within seconds, they called back. I thought, that's strange. So I picked up the phone, and uh, I was a police officer. And he said, is this Mark? I said, yes. He's like, your mom is very upset, and you need to go to her house. And I'm kind of half asleep. I'm like, what do you mean I need to drive to my mom's house? Like, it's a 40, 45 minute drive. It's, you know, 40 kilometers away. It's 1130 for me. It's kind of the middle of the night. Like, why do I need to go there? And he just kept reiterating. She's very upset. She needs you. You need to go to her house. And I told him, look, if I'm getting, if I'm getting dressed and driving across town at 1130 at night on a Thursday, you better tell me why. And he just kind of took a breath and there was a pause and he said, your father's dead. And that, like, it, 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 it hits you, like, it's physical. It's not, I mean, you hear the words, but the, just the air comes out of you. And I just, I dropped the phone and I just, I fell to my knees. And all I remember saying is I had so much that I wanted to tell him. And so it wasn't even about, like, there's going to be things in my life that we haven't experienced yet. It's, there's just things I wanted to chat about with him. That I didn't get to. <clears throat> so, um, so it was really difficult. And, you know, I drove to my mom's and, and they told us what happened. He drove into the middle of the Lionsgate Bridge in Vancouver, which is a huge, iconic bridge. He had rented a car, which he had a nice car. He didn't need to rent a car. Um, and he just pulled it up in the middle of the lane. He didn't pull over or anything. He just got out, hit the hazard lights. Of course, because he's being considerate, I guess, of the other drivers. And he left the door open and 
and he just went up and it didn't take him a second. He just he jumped and a cyclist saw it happen. And I remember when I when I when they explained what happened, it occurred to me that people call that the coward's way out. And I remember distinctly thinking about how brave you have to be to stand at the precipice and look down into the fog. It was it was, it was a foggy night, and that that drop is, uh, I don't know how big it is, but I mean, there's no coming back from it. And I remember thinking it was a very brave act, and it, and there was no cowardice in it. So so we did it, and um, we were kind of left to pick up the pieces. But I think at the end of this story, what I'm the reason I'm telling it is because here's an example of somebody who had it all figured out, who financially was fit, who meant, you know, going into this mentally was fit, physically was fit, socially was fit, had everything that you think somebody would need to go and enjoy a, ses- a successful retirement. And he was completely undone by it in less than 18 months. And I believe it's because his identity was so attached to his business. I, I don't think he realized that the business that he had created and the the community that he had created through his business was so ingrained in him and, and so important to him that flicking the switch and selling it and being gone the next day, it just stripped him. It stripped him of everything that that he was and and his identity was was gone. And I think he was just it's probably just loneliness and emptiness, if if nothing else. So that that's the story. And it, it I didn't mean to go on as long as I did, but I think um it's helpful for me to even just say it out loud. So thank you. Well, thank you for sharing it, Mark. It's a incredible story. Um, so how has this experience with your dad affected the way that you talk to, to your clients? You're, you're an advisor in British Columbia. How does this affect your relationship, the way you talk to clients about retirement? You know, it's something I, I think I still need to get better at doing. Like we don't have, I have experience in this firsthand because of this, what what I've gone through, but I don't have training in this. I'm not a psychologist. Somebody else on Twitter mentioned to me, another advisor, that the best thing he did for himself was he actually went and got palliative care and bereavement training Hmm. so to be able to have these conversations with people. And Hmm. I thought, wow, that's just, that's so outside the box. And it's something I would have never thought to do. And I think as advisors, we we believe that our clients probably have some other network or some other outlet or somewhere to go, whether it's through like a program they have at work or just people they know where they've prepared for this. And we're just kind of responsible for the financial silo of it. We spend so much time talking about money and preparing them for that, that I believe it's it's difficult to also consider the the mental and the social issues of retirement. So it's something I'm trying to get better at and trying to implement in conversations with clients. I don't have a great framework, but in hearing the stories from people on Twitter that have reached out to me over the past 24 hours, I have hundreds of messages of people just writing to me and saying, I went through the same thing. Uh, My parents went through it. My uncle went through it. I'm about to retire and I hadn't thought of this and now I'm terrified. And that wasn't my intent, but I didn't realize how common it was until I started getting these responses and these messages. And so now I do want to think about this more and I do want to make this more a more integral part of the conversations that I have. Um, so I've been kind of taking notes on some of these responses and people sharing resources and books and YouTube videos about this exact topic. So I've got some work to do. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Huh. How, how did the, the, the whole experience that you just talked about in that, in that story that you told us, how has it affected the way that you approach your own life? I don't think I really needed to think about it too much until quite recently. I, you know, prior to me, I, I, I joined a team uh, with the firm I work for now. I joined a, a pre-existing team, but prior to that, I was with uh, kind of a bigger firm and it was more of a kind of nine to five. So I had a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility and work was just work, right? I wasn't trying to build a business. I wasn't trying to build a reputation. I just showed up. And so I had all the freedom in the world. Uh, I could kind of do whatever I wanted and nobody was going to breathe down my neck about it. So my work certainly wasn't my identity at that point even though I love the type of work that I do, the financial planning work we do and the relationships we have with people is important to me. My work wasn't everything. Um, But now I'm seeing in myself how easy it is to go down this path Mm -hmm. because now that I'm working for this team and I'm um, in effect more responsible for my own destiny in terms of how I create my business and how I just how I do the work that I do. I'm starting to 
just to acknowledge and to realize how easy it is to go down this path, right? Like I, my son goes to bed at night and I go back to work and I'm telling myself it's because there's work to be done, but I have to admit, I say, I love it. And so am I really just filling my free time with work because that's what I want to do? And I'm out there on Twitter every day talking to people about financial planning and I'm giving, you know, not advice per se, but guidance. And my inbox is full of people who just maybe wouldn't be a good client for me. And I'm saying, let's just hop on a call and maybe I can help you with something. So my dad was the tile guy and am I creating a life for myself where I'm the money guy? And I don't think I had to worry about it until, you know, the past 12 to 18 months. Um, so I think it's affecting me now. And I think it's something that I need to, to recognize, acknowledge and, and do something about, and I'm 39 now, so I've got time to do it, but I can see, I know myself, I can just see myself pushing this off and saying, this is something you will deal with later. Hmm. And I don't want to do that. For those who are interested, they can follow you at Mark McGrath CFP on Twitter. What message do you want to leave with our listeners and viewers? Yeah, I think you need to start thinking about this. Um, and I don't think there's ever a time that's too early to think about it. Again, just and I'm only I'm honestly only realizing this because of the number of people that I've talked to in the past 24 hours that have reached out with stories. Some of them are 25 years old and they're building a business and they're saying this, this meant your message meant something to me because I'm just so ingrained in this business. And I recognize that if I can look at this now and think about this now, I just have a longer runway to prepare and to, to find value and fulfillment and meaning in some other area of my life that will definitely be there when, when retirement comes. Um, so I I'd say, look at it now. And I don't know that I've got the answer on how to solve the problem, right? I do think that your relationships uh, with people, with your family, with people, with your community, um, being of service to people that, that, you know, whether it's friends or family or, or volunteering or something like that, a anything that I think is that you find rewarding that you can sit back and be proud of and, and be happy that you contributed to can be perhaps an outlet for this. Cause I don't think retirement is just about, you know, going golfing and traveling. I think you just get sick of that really quickly. So if, if there's one message, I think it's, Look at this now, regardless of where you are in your journey towards retirement, uh, or if you're in retirement, think about it now. It's a great message. Mark, thanks so much for sharing. And it's been great to get to know you over the past few weeks, certainly on Twitter and a few conversations. So I appreciate that. And, and we're lucky to have you in our Canadian advisory community. So thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks, guys. And thank you. I mean, you've you've done a, a tremendous credit to the industry, to, to the people of Canada, to advisors like myself. And um, I'm grateful, so thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right, so let's jump into one episode in 60 seconds. And before I start, um, the notes for this, Ben, were prepared before Mark's tweet sharing the story of his father. And it's interesting to think about it because that story combined with Dennis's main message really does make one pause and consider you know, who we are and who we want to become. And that, that was the main message from this conversation with Dennis. So with that, let's go to the episode review. So Dennis Mosey Williams joined us in episode 85. Dennis is an advisor to advisors like us, coaching financial advisory firms on how to deliver a great client experience. So what does that mean? Great client experience. So we are living in an experienced economy and in financial services, that means people deserve more than simply the service of retirement planning and portfolio management. Those are services which can be delivered in a way to save time and money. However, consumers are looking for something more. They want to become something more. This is what people want and deserve. A shift from the products and services to what you are going to do with your money and who you want to become. And that is what Dennis is all about. So this requires an advisor interested in you that asks great questions, that gets you in a space that you can think about all this. This is the kind of experience that people are looking for. And this means that you as a consumer need to, of course, do proper due diligence. And then you need to find an advisor and a firm where you feel at home, where you can check your fear and uncertainty and feel free to imagine the possible, to have a well-designed experience, time well spent. Fantastic conversation. That was episode 85 with Dennis Mosey Williams. It's also interesting, Ben, to think about this, you know, to, to link back with a conversation with, with Sam and Danielle too, right? To have a space out of those goals conversations as well. So it's it's interesting now, like I said off the top, how all these things have kind of come together in this one episode. Hmm. I, as you're as you're recapping the 
episode with Dennis, I was thinking the exact same thing that how, how well does that episode fit in with both of these other conversations that we, that we have in this episode? It's incredible. And the other thing that I'd forgotten that we learned was that you were super cool. <laughs> I mean, not that you're not super cool now, but you used to press your own skateboards. That I is, forgot, that is true. I've forgotten all about that. I used to take, um, I guess it was eighth inch plywood and I had a, a skateboard press. So it's like, it's like uh, wood that's been cut out in whatever shape you want. So you have it like a, a curve Yep. and then you have maybe a tail for the little kick tail or whatever. So yeah, I used to, uh, used to press plywood into, into skateboards and ride them around. It's true. And now can you make that in your 3d printer? Uh, I could, I could make the, the press shapes probably out of the 3d printer, but, um, not the actual skateboard though. How, how did that come up in a conversation with, I don't, with Dennis? Well, well, Dennis is, Dennis is so engaging and so he's hilarious. And it was a, it was really fun to go back and listen to it. And it's timeless. It's a really, really, really great conversation. Hmm. He was also on with our friend Jason Pereira last week. Also a great conversation that they had. All right, let's go to the book review, if that's good with you. Um, this week is a book referred by a friend of ours, Ben in Montreal. So Ben, thank you. You're a very thoughtful reader. So as soon as you recommended it, I knew we had to read this book. And it is called The Status Game on Human Life and How to Play It by Will Storr. So Will Storr is a British author and has been a contributing editor to Esquire and GQ Australia. Author of six books, including both fiction and nonfiction probably best known as I've looked into him for his science of storytelling workshops that he leads around the world, which is kind of cool. Anyways, the main point of the book is that our brains are continually, and as he says in countless ways, measuring where we sit versus other people. And you and I have talked about this a lot. You've talked about how we as humans compare ourselves to others and how we measure our life satisfaction often in relation to others. So the author proposes that life is a status game and that we're all playing this game, but the rules are hidden. They're built into us. They silently direct us how we think, what we believe, uh, how we act. He argues that the game is inside of us and we cannot help but play this status game, which is so interesting to think about. Anyways, these processes that our brain goes through are subconscious, completely hidden. And basically the brain feeds you this a simplification of stories of your life so that you can create your own life story. And this story ties together all this chaos that we all live every single day to make it tolerable for our brain to understand what we're living. And so the book is about this game and it really, it, it, it's really well written. It really makes you stop and think. I've got a ton of notes. I could be here all day talking about it. Perhaps not that great, but I could, it's just such a, a deep thinking book. Anyway, so status is when people defer to us, offer respect, admiration, or praise, or allow us to influence them in some way. Hmm. It is not about being liked or accepted. Those are separate needs and those are associated with connections. So status is about people deferring to us, offering us respect, admiration, or praise. And again, we've talked about this a lot with all kinds of different guests over the past almost five years now. So there's a powerful link between status and well-being. And we work hard to accomplish status by seeking connection with others and to be accepted into a group. And this is demonstrated by the group's approval or acclaim. And, you know, workforce is such a great example. Talked about that. You know, we, we, we talked about how often there's big ego leaders, and this goes back to how ambitious, right? Big ego leaders um, does not necessarily mean they have status. And the author here talks about how a relatively low-ranking team member can go into a work meeting, contribute a great idea, receive attention, praise, and influence, leave feeling great, they gain status in that hmm. environment. Status symbols, talked a lot about that in the book. We use status symbols to attempt to demonstrate that we are part of a group and to effectively make it easier for others to see what group we are in and also to seek admiration. And this goes hmm. on invisibly, which really makes you stop and think because there is no definitive scorecard in the status game. We can never see where players sit versus us in the rankings. One way to see where you are is to look for symbols that we might attach particular value. 
In order to manage this process, the subconscious has a status detection system that includes mechanisms that read relevant cues in the environment to assess status. Owning stuff, he says, is all to do with status amongst competitors. So mm -hmm. it makes me think of the example of Morgan Housel. He may have used this in our conversation. He was a valet driver, uh, you know, parking cars in Southern California when he was young, and he used to admire the fancy cars when they would come in. But he says, I never admired the driver. Whereas a driver may have bought that status car unbeknownst to that person that they were buying this thinking they would have status, right? As a cue for status, which really it, is But is it might make them feel like they have it though. You, you should have seen, what, when, I, when I did a, a YouTube video on luxury vehicles and I talked about the, the uh, li literature suggesting that they don't make you happier, they don't increase your well-being and all that kind of stuff. Yep. You should have seen the furious comments from luxury vehicle owners about how important it is to their life and to their identity. And I'm just like, all right, man, if it's that important to you, cool. Well, I've thought about this because as you know, I drive a relatively nice German car. Am I just convincing myself that I really like the feel, the tightness, like, and I think I do, but I, I can't be oblivious to what the, the argument the author is making, right? Which is maybe deep down somewhere I, I'm putting this message out that I'm, that this German car is sending a signal. I don't but know. I love, I must say, I love every time I drive it. I have no regrets. I've had it now for four years. No regrets. So I don't know. You have told me more than once that you don't regret having that car, though. Never. So maybe you, maybe, but you've told me that more than right. once. So right. maybe you question, maybe you question it on some level. Maybe, but it's a level I don't, I'm not aware of. Hmm. Summertime, man. Nice day to wash it. I love it. Maybe that's <laughs> sending a signal too. Who knows? But what about like even you and I, we don't wear suits anymore. Yeah. Right? Like we're in pretty casual clothes. Is that some sort of status symbol deep down that we're sending a signal that we don't need to have suits? I don't know. Hmm. Interesting question. Anyways, researchers find that happiness isn't closely linked to our macro socioeconomic status. It's actually our smaller games that matter. Studies show that respect and admiration within one's local group, but not socioeconomic status, predicts subjective well being. Hmm. Anyways, uh, talk a lot about. Um, successful groups are status generating machines. They thrive when they make status, both for their players and for the game itself. And they talk about how this happens in, in uh, professions or trades. You know, you take our, our industry, for example, credentials, levels of expertise, master level. You know, you could have that, you could be a master chef or a master blacksmith or a, you know, a certain level of lawyer or brewer, for example. All of these are status levels, right? That are recognized inside your group. Um, ambitious young players apprenticed before moving to the next level. I mean, very common, I think, in a lot of different trades. Then this was fascinating. They talk about how a work ethic came into being, largely caused by these groups, which, in which work itself became prestigious. So this shifted to a more work-centered society, you know, through the Industrial Revolution. Where we get status has shifted over the centuries. It used to come more from what we did for the clan, I'm quoting here, the community, and now it is more shifted to our individual competence and success and the signaling around that. We are turning into a new sort of human with a new style of game playing brain. We are more independent, more self-focused, more outward looking, and more interested in personal excellent, excellence, less conformist, and less in awe of tradition. kind of interesting mm -hmm. very uh, Adam Smith didn't believe greed for wealth was the ultimate driver of uh, economies he thought something else was going on something deeper in the human psyche quote humanity does not desire to be great but to be beloved that was written in 1759 the rich man glories in his riches because he feels they naturally draw upon him the attention of the world and he is fonder of his wealth on this account than for all the other advantages it procures him the need for attention and approval was, for Smith, a fundamental part of the human condition. We strive to better our lot because we seek to be observed, to be attended to, and to be taken care of. Hmm. Kind of interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. It is. So then he, he, he posed these questions at the end, like, what would, like, is it possible 
to live without status? How important it is that we have this invisible drive for status, for respect and admiration? That's the um, Andrew Hallam question about luxury cars. W would you, like Cameron, would you want your, this is, this is the litmus test, would you want your fancy German car if you lived on a desert island with paved roads that nobody else would ever see it? Yeah, I remember when he asked that. It's a good question. So there you go. No status on a desert island. And I think I'd say yes, and listeners probably think I'm nuts. I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily true. Um, yeah. So there you go. Really enjoyed the book. Very thoughtful book. And thanks to Ben for the recommendation. The status mm -hmm. game. I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, that, that, that book fits with the overall theme of this episode. It's almost as if we, it's almost as if we planned the episode out. <laughs> agree, we, we, to lose. we didn't. Um, okay, let's go to the after show. So much going on this past week. I know we're not a new show, but any observations on or thoughts after almost a week now since SBV? Yeah, my observation is that I'm not going to volunteer my observation because everybody else did. It's kind of <laughs> like it's all been said, right? But I think a lot of people either learned or relearned a lot. Yeah, I I I, I want to do a I want to do a a video and maybe a, a rational minder podcast topic on what is the risk free asset or or which asset is riskless because that was one of the big lessons from. SBV, they owned the kind of definitional riskless asset, but they had a duration mismatch, which caused some real, some real problems. Yeah. Yeah. And some wild moves in the fixed income market too. Like biggest moves in the past. I think some of them were almost 30 years, the two, three year term moves. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we mentioned asking people to, if they could chime in with some ratings on Apple, we got 20 new ratings. We're almost at a thousand, five more to a thousand. From our completely arbitrary goal of, of a thousand. I wanted to ask you too. So, so Mark was on today and it was great to have him. Um, you've been much more active on Twitter and are more deliberate in putting out threads and I'm becoming a little more deliberate also. Any thoughts around that? I, I think it's, it's a place where a lot of people are and as much as I haven't been active tweeting on Twitter for a while, it's one of the places that I go to scroll when I want to scroll stuff, um, along with, uh, with Reddit usually. Um, but there are a lot of eyeballs on Twitter. There are a lot of people interacting socially on, on Twitter. And, uh, I just, I don't know. I, I thought it would be another place that we could share some of the work that we've done. And this is the part that I, I think I did a better job of connecting the dots this past week, as I told you and Angelica, there's a lot of people lurking there. And even though we might have, you know, a few thousand followers, it can get presented to many, many more people. And although I knew that, when you see some threads, like like Mark's thread that we talked about, seen by several million people, when something gets picked up and goes viral, it can be very impactful. Even when it doesn't, right? For sure. Even when it doesn't go viral, I think a lot of people are seeing the stuff on uh on Twitter. It's a very interesting platform. Hopefully it doesn't, uh, hopefully it doesn't implode. My experience lately has been great. I find my feed is super clean, not too oh, many the, ads, not too much junk. The following feed of where you only see stuff from the people that you're following is, is very clean. I even find the other one, the for you feed to be clean. I've cleaned out all the political stuff. So maybe that's why, I don't know. Uh, let's go through some reviews. You want to kick it off? Sure. From uh, Sask -sk -sk -sk. <laughs> uh, in Canada, they say that every episode is five stars, worth it every time. The perfect finance podcast. That is very kind. Ardrum, again, from the States on the Apple podcast, my favorite podcast. While I'm not a financial professional, I've learned to continue and continue to learn so much from this wonderful podcast. I've been inspired to learn additional content. Um, we offer so much valuable information and insight on financial topics and living a good life. And I've greatly enjoyed the academic integrity. I can honestly say that I read many more books now and I find myself habitually applying what I've learned. 
I feel like I'm a student in a graduate level class each time I start a new episode, which is a delightful feeling, exclamation mark. Kind of a cool way to describe the podcast. That's very kind. Uh, Kobe Trey from the United States says that it's a fantastic podcast. Uh, I cannot get enough of the thoughtful content in this podcast. After being a boglehead type investor for 20 years, they've broadened, broadened my horizons. I've listened to probably hundreds of hours of their podcasts and find them to be wonderfully evidence-based. As a physician, I find this very refreshing. I have shared their podcast with many of my friends and colleagues. Thank you, gentlemen, for all that you do. We appreciate you sharing the podcast. Kobe Trey and the kind words. Mike Flitt from the States. Fantastic show that digs into details most podcasts or shows aren't willing to get into. It's relief for a financial show that doesn't gloss over jargon and bury the reader in confusion, but actually explain mechanics in a way that is understandable to most. The bar is set high by Ben and Cameron. Thanks, Mike. That that review makes me think that we maybe should have given more a more detailed take on uh, on SBV. Maybe maybe next week. Well, you did say you're coming out with a podcast that will, or a yeah, YouTube that will touch on it. That's true. And there was just so much information out there. It was like overload with predictions and opinion and explanations from every possible angle from various levels of expertise. I just. I just couldn't. Felt, yeah. felt wrong to contribute to, to that. Uh, the big, the big B master from Canada says, "Great podcast. This podcast is a real gem. If you love learning, then you're going to love this podcast." Duncan McN from Canada. Great to hear a Canadian perspective. The podcast has a lot of complex information delivered clearly. Hearing interesting financial topics from north of the border is a big bonus. Um, had some amazing. Uh, people reach out to us this past couple of weeks. Justin in San Francisco says we are keeping him on plan and is asking about a meetup in Los Angeles, which may happen in September. If you are interested in that and want to try to convince us, um, you can drop a note to info at rationalminder.ca. That was on LinkedIn. We'll be there anyway. I don't know how much convincing we need, right? Well, it takes some energy to organize it and whatnot, so we'll see. Yeah, that's true, right. I got a really nice email from Kristen, and she said I could read this out. Hi there. I just, just wanted to send a note of thanks for your informative podcast. I was introduced through the Money Mechanic from the FI Garage podcast and Epic podcast. As he speaks highly of you both, in the past couple of years, I have become much more interested in DIY investing and learning to take control of my finances and behaviors surrounding money. Although I have established some good habits like paying myself first with low-cost diversified index ETFs, I had become interested in dividend strategies and started implementing a small percentage to my portfolio. Since listening to your podcast, I will now be ceasing that strategy and sticking with my original plan. Although I had to listen and re-listen to the various podcasts on the irrelevance of dividends. I feel I feel like it is now sinking in. I see how the math research stats just don't measure up to an indexing strategy. Ultimately, I would love someone to tell me that it will be all okay in my retirement, and I know that there isn't a crystal ball, but I do appreciate the effort put forward to back up your arguments with these important rational reminders. Anyhow, I want to share my gratitude and look forward to learning more. Kristen, thanks for the kind note. I, I don't want to complicate things for Kristen. Um, but I think it's important to say this, that dividends, a dividend strategy um, has exposure to multiple risk factors. D dividend yield proxies for exposure to other risks like value and profitability and investment. So to say that indexing is unconditionally superior to dividend investing, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think indexing is more diversified. Um, it's, it's likely to be more tax efficient. Uh, depending on your situation, but in, in a lot of cases it will be. Um, but a dividend portfolio, a, a well-diversified dividend portfolio could well have higher expected returns than a market cap weighted index fund. I think you to, to have that conversation properly, you have to control for exposure to other risks. So a factor tilt matched portfolio that uses low cost index funds uh, and, and similar types of products, I think that is objectively superior to a dividend strategy. But to say that indexing is unconditionally better than a dividend portfolio, I mean, that gets, and again, I don't want to complicate things for, for Kristen, which I'm absolutely <laughs> doing, but I, I, I had to say that because it's, I mean, yeah. On Twitter, I got a really nice note from Dominic in Poland. 
He said, I recently shared the RR podcast on Twitter in a Polish thread regarding best financial content on the internet. I have to admit, I am really pleased you were the one who liked my comment. I'm from Poland and I have been listening to your and Ben's podcast for over two years now. And I cannot emphasize enough how big an impact you guys have had on my approach to finance. The quality of information you are sharing is incredible and this is especially valuable for an Eastern European guy like me where access to such content is limited and where self-made investing gurus and fat greedy mutual funds uh, make investing complicated and confusing. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. Recent years have brought some change and there is more and more information regarding sensible approaches to investing and I think you guys had your part in it. Thanks so much for your work. Greetings from Poland. That was Dominic. Thanks for reaching out. Uh, Niren says that he's very happy to see Ben actively tweeting. That was on uh, on Twitter. And I want to thank Evan in St. Catharines and Luke in Oklahoma, who are two very active supporters of our messages on Twitter. So just a shout out to Evan and Luke. Anything cooking in the community lately, Ben? Uh, no, the, the, the discussion, I think probably the most active discussion recently um has been on at the svb situation so i mean I've, of course i've been reading that discussion as i've been reading all of the other stuff on the topic because it's uh it, it was a big a big thing that happened um so that's been in there and uh a lot of discussion on on risk parity and momentum but it's, cool. it's pretty it's, it gets pretty intense in there like you can <laughs> There are some deep, deep, deep rabbit holes that are just getting deeper and deeper by the minute in the in the rational minor community. Uh, last call for our meetup next week on the 28th, March 28th in Montreal. If you're interested in joining us, info at rationalreminder.ca. We've confirmed a date for our meetup in Toronto. That will be September 20th in the evening. So again, email. Let us know if you're interested. Connect with us. We're both on Twitter. Ben's more active on Twitter and people are liking it. Um, yeah anything else Ben uh, no I think that's I think that's good always available on LinkedIn too I'm hearing from a ton of people on LinkedIn I'm hearing from a lot of advisors so if you want to reach out and chat love talking with advisors wherever you are alright as always thanks everybody for listening mm-hmm.